Hi, my name is Dr. Amanda Dawson, and I'm an assistant professor and head of the BA Theater Arts Program in the Kane College of the Arts at Utah State University. I also advise our theater minors, and I teach courses in the BFA Theater Education Program. I'm a new Aggie. I joined the USU Department of Theater Arts in August 2020. Prior to coming to Utah, I was an assistant professor of theater and speech at Brescia University in Owensboro, Kentucky, which is where my COVID teaching first began. The last year has helped me to employ empathy as a tool for COVID teaching. In the arts, storytelling and empathy come naturally, especially in theater. We tell the stories of others, often people not at all like us. We step into characters and design the worlds around them. Theater artists can't help but to relate and empathize with the people at the center of our stories. During this pandemic, employing empathy has become one of my greatest pedagogical tools. Generally, I consider myself to be a generous but rigorous professor. At times, my desire for rigor and challenge supersedes my generosity and empathy. The shift to online in spring 2020 and the continued pandemic teaching ever since has called upon my empathy skills. COVID teaching has asked me to be more patient, more present, and more pliable. And in our short 10-minute presentation today, I'm going to share some tips and tips tricks and tools that have helped me to survive and perhaps even thrive in my first semester and a half at USU. My hope is at the end of our time together, you'll take away three tools of empathy to listen, to respond, and to adapt. As I mentioned, I'm a rigorous and perhaps strict professor. I generally do not give extensions. Extra credit is extremely limited. I have a strict attendance policy. Late work always comes with a loss of points. I expect that exams will take the entire class period to complete and I assign a lot of readings, a lot. Those are just some of my practices of my pedagogy. But I also consider myself to be a rigorous, gracious, available, open, and perhaps most importantly, empathetic teacher. I believe that empathy comes from a variety of places. Maybe it's inherent, maybe we are taught it, but many scholars that believe that we become more empathetic when we engage in storytelling. In the journal Basic and Applied Social Psychology from 2014, researcher Dan Johnson published a study that found that reading fiction, or otherwise engaging with fiction, increased empathy towards others. Therefore, if learning about people in fiction can lead us to become more empathetic, what can learning from our students, their stories and experiences do for us? I believe it can make us better teachers. So step one, to listen. In fall 2020, I taught three face-to-face -face courses in theater, and this semester I'm teaching two face-to-face -face and one broadcast course. Like I mentioned, I'm new to the department and to Utah, and in a field like theater, everyone tends to know each other and become close very quickly. So my plan was to dive in headfirst to start building those relationships. On the first day of class, I asked students the following questions. What is your name? Where are you from? What is your major? Why theater as a major or minor or just a class they happen to be taking? And what is something interesting we should know about them? Now, is this a revolutionary idea for the first day of class? No. Am I the first person to have students do this? Obviously not. But is it a vital first step in my teaching philosophy? You betcha. On day one, I want my students to know that their stories matter and that we as a class are going to listen to and learn from their stories. I also try to get to my class at least 10 minutes in advance, like many of us do, but I use that time not just to get technology going, but to check in with them as they arrive. I want to learn more about them, their stories, how they're handling COVID, talking about the class, what Netflix shows they've been binging. And again, these are not revolutionary ideas, but for me, they make all the difference. Julie Beck wrote an article for The Atlantic in 2015 about life stories, where she said, quote, in the realm of narrative psychology, a person's life story is not a Wikipedia biography of facts and events of a life, but rather the way a person integrates those facts and events internally, picks them apart, and weaves them back together to make meaning. This narrative becomes a form of identity, in, in, um, excuse me, in which some of the things someone chooses to include in their life story and the way she tells it can both reflect and shape who she is. A life story doesn't just say what happened. It says why it was important and what it means for who the person is, for who they'll become, and for what happens next, end quote. So I decided to get some feedback from my students at the end of the sixth week of the classes in fall. This provided an opportunity to get to know the students better 
and to see how they're handling the semester. And as of course, get feedback on my classes. I asked all my classes four questions. One, how are you managing the semester? Jobs, school, COVID, all the things. Two, what are the strengths of this class? What do you like about it? And would you like to continue to see happen in the class? Number three, what are the challenges or obstacles of the class? What would you like to see changed in the class? And four, what else do you want me to know? Why wait for student evaluations to gauge what is working and what isn't? Why not listen and respond now, long before we get to being evaluated by them? The responses to questions one were insightful but heavy. Students said things such as, I'm tired of wearing a mask and being afraid, and I'm tired of never hearing the end all of the politics of it. I'm doing the best I can. I'm dealing with heightened anxiety. I'm stressed. I do not have enough time for homework and I'm getting no sleep. Students shared about lost jobs, sick family members, and more. And remember, I just met these students six weeks prior. I think they were some grateful that someone asked the question. Some of the positive responses I got about the strengths of the class in question two include the following. I really enjoyed the discussions we have in this class. Teaching secondary theater is not a simple task, and I feel better having had the conversations we do. I like the passion I see in your teaching and the focus on inclusivity and context. I think the biggest strength of this class is the open discussion. We do a good job communicating as a class and moving a discussion forward. I like that you let us discuss and give us a place to be heard. You are constantly challenging what we accept to be the norm in this class, and I would like you to continue to make us aware of issues that we need to be prepared for. But students were also struggling with my course. In terms of question three, the challenges and obstacles of the course, students shared, I struggled with the reading sometimes because I'm a slow reader, which I know will get better over time. Due to the nature of our discussions, we normally don't touch on all the readings and don't have time to talk about them in great depth. I wish we read more comedies or at least lighthearted plays. There's a lot of negative stuff being thrown at us every day from our personal lives, the media, the news, and social constructs and we could all use a little more positivity in our lives. Finally, with question four, not all students shared something that they wanted me to know, but most of them did. They shared funny stories, learning issues, praise, and critiques. My advice, ask your students questions and really listen to the answers. How do you do that? Ask questions in class, on a discussion board, a journal response, extra credit, whatever you have to do to get the feedback you need. All right, so step two. Respond. The response step can be a bit more challenging. With something like this informal feedback, I make sure that they know that I have heard them. I responded with comments on Canvas. I addressed the reoccur recurring praise or concerns they had um, during the following class period. I kept or amped up the pieces of the class they liked and learned from. And more importantly, I made change. Or in some cases, I explained that change wasn't possible. For example, students were absolutely correct in stating that it was frustrating to be assigned readings and then never get to discuss them in class. While that might be valuable in some fields, some classes, some circumstances, it did not work for these students. And they didn't want to waste time reading material that we would never cover. That seems like an easy one to respond to. I can keep them and ignore the students, or I can ensure that I build time to get to all the readings, or I could cut some of what I consider to be the secondary reasons. I did a little bit of all three. An example of something I could not change was the request for more comedies. They had already bought all the plays we were going to read. I could not ask them to buy more, but I still addressed this in class. I explained the reasoning for the selection of the plays, and I ensured them that I would consider more lighthearted plays for future semesters. Now, I didn't respond to every strength or challenge of the course, but by responding to some of the more pressing comments, I let the students know that they were being heard and that I valued their input, which leads us to step three, to adapt. We all know the phrase, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. But something doesn't need to be broken in order to improve it or change it. I've painted walls that look just fine. I've traded in cars that still run, and I've cut material from my class in the middle of the semester. Just because you've always done it that way doesn't mean it's the best way. Throw out the old and broken stuff update the slightly damaged or scuffed stuff, and add in something totally new. It'll make a difference for you and for your students. Definitions of empathy all focus on feelings, but these tools aren't just about feelings. 
listening, responding, and adapting are necessary tools for teachers, especially during a pandemic. Thank you.